will now continue the debate on the topic you started. We will now have the panel discussion on data uh, with its key aim to discuss the main and critical consequences of the growing data gravity, increased Im implementation of cloud technology, and also how regulatory landscape should meet this challenge in order to preserve citizens' privacy and security. Speakers will also refer to the question on how to make the data we generate contribute to the good of the society as a whole. Please remember that you can use the Q&A box in order to ask the questions. Our speakers can answer them typing the answer directly in the box or the moderator of the session can decide on answering them live. We deeply encourage you to get involved in the discussion. So let me introduce to you uh, Mia Petra Kumpulanatri, member of the Europe, European Parliament, Cecilia bonnefeld dahl Director General of the Digital Europe, Pierre Chastanet, Head of Unit Cloud and Software at the DigiConnect European Commission. The session will be moderated by Paul Timmers, Research Associate at Oxford University and former Director the Sustainable and Secure Society Directorate at the DigiConnect European Commission and also member of the CyberSec Program Committee. Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Barbara. Uh, I hope everybody can see and hear me. Um, very happy that I can moderate this session and it's a great idea. Uh, congratulations to CyberSec to continue in this difficult times in this uh, way of uh, being in contact in an online form. Now, this session is called Data Sovereign and Secure. And uh, in this session, uh, you will see that there's a very good chaining with the previous session about artificial intelligence. As Killian Gross already said, uh, artificial intelligence lives on data. And so there's also a data policy that is now on the table. And we have been uh, working uh, across Europe for quite a long time, all of us, I think, in reflections on what is this with data? It's so important. It's really part of the national assets. It needs to be protected. It needs to be secure. That's a secure element. It also needs to be protected in terms of uh, rights. Data protection is a familiar issue for all of us in the field of uh, data. Um, and we need to get the real benefits uh, from it. So it's almost like a natural resource. And then you will quickly talk about sovereignty because uh, in the traditional way of sovereignty, you would protect your territory and your natural resources. Well, that would include data, isn't it? So we are talking about secure and sovereign in data against the background of this uh, new policy. Just a little word. Uh, already during this conference, there has been a lot of talk about data, data spaces, and also about uh, sovereignty. And there are many views on sovereignty. Um, in this context, for example, if you think about data sovereignty, you could uh, look at the definition that is taken in the Federated Cloud Initiative in Germany, Gaia-X, that says that data sovereignty is the complete control over stored and processed data, and also the independent decision on who's permitted to have access to it. And then data, of course, lives in a world of cloud services very often. And then by consequence, you can also talk about cloud sovereignty. We can talk about many forms of sovereignty. It's all about this ability to decide and act upon these essential aspects of our economy and society and democracy. It's about strategic autonomy. So in this panel, um, where I will give in a minute the floor to Mia Petra Kumpula Natri, uh, we will essentially talk about what is it that we actually want, you know, our sovereign and secure the right objectives. Secondly, we will talk about this new policy uh, put on the table on the 19th of February, is the right policy? And then we talk about implementation. What should happen? How do we get there? So without further ado, let me give the floor to Mia Petra. I'm very happy that uh, you are here and that you can address us as a member of European Parliament, as having a long, long involvement in the digital policy field, as uh, Madame Roaming, <laughs> congratulations with that honorary title, and also as being an engineer yourself. So, Mia Petra, first uh, the floor to yours. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good, because I've been following some of the debates earlier and then just listening mode. So, uh, hello everybody. Uh, this greetings comes from Finland. Uh, and yes, I'm educated engineer, but that was the NMT times, if some of you remember that. So trying to keep up now with the 5G and AI, it's not 
um, very easy for a politician and uh, doing a lot of things. But um, uh, then I, I think as a role as a politician, our role is to keep uh, visions alive and uh, values uh, in, inside the, the politics. So uh, let me start by my beliefs in the, the situation where we are. We are in the beginning of the data economy. And even, we though, even though we have the global actors and, and Europe not leading in, in all the uh, sectors, we still are in the beginning of the data economy. So I'm a strong believer that newcomers will come and new actors will come. And still we have a time to adapt to policies and even make policies uh, for this data economy. We have seen that the first wave of the personal data uh, um, so sector moving uh, moving a lot and then big uh, players there, but then we can see the, the second phase or second wave of the data called industrial data often by Breton, a new commission is coming and then we do have a lot uh, newcomers and, and uh, even Europe can be active and, and doing that. So yes, I do want to believe that EU wants to be successful and we need actions also, the, the proactive actions as the European policy makers, uh, then uh, to keep on the track on the data that is increasing so much. So this is not uh, something that it's everything done and only the players and uh, people who, who know it now can uh, join, but all the SMEs and a lot of new actors. So this is why I think that uh, also that it has been the geeks, uh, the, the activists playing a role, uh, uh, for example, who knows about AI, who knows about the cloud computing, who have even ever heard about the um, uh, edge computing. So now it's getting broader, it should get broader, it should, uh, people acting on the different sectors of the uh, business should become uh, familiar with the AI should become familiar with the possibilities of the cloud and, and a massive amount of data handling. So analysts uh, will have a lot of work if they do understand the uh, techniques as well. So uh, as I see these uh, European ecosystems is an answer also for Europe to boost new jobs and, and create new, uh, um, uh, new economical activities. Uh, so my answer for the sovereignty as, as a title is always a bit something that I do not personally understand that much, as I still hope that even after the spring uh, or and summer, we do have an open um, uh, economical, economy system inside EU, but also globally, then, uh, then uh, it is all fair to fight for the European ecosystems to uh, include as much as possible the data economy. Also those sectors that we have uh, uh, we are lacking now, um, where the, the big uh, technological giants, also the sponsors for this uh, uh, gathering now are playing parts. So the, my question is that how we promote European value chains and how we create the ecosystems. And that then includes also the uh, possibility to, to uh, handle data. As I said, it will increase exponentially, uh, industrial data, internet of everything data, so then how to do that? And I see the infrastructure is some a key element was missing from the last uh, list we saw on the AI. Uh, if we do lack the uh, infrastructure, if we do not have the 5G in place, if we do not have the good connections of the fibers, uh, it comes. And then the cloud, if for me, it is also a question of the uh, infrastructure. And then the European clouds, is it federal clouds? How do we do more then? And then they also know that there are big players, global players dominating the market, but there will be still a special need for the different clouds for the different purposes. And the, the European um, ideas are very welcome to, to work more on those. I will conclude uh, this uh, opening remark that as a politician, the public debate is needed as European values are something that we, politicians and, and uh, regulators need to uh, keep in mind and see that uh, privacy, democracy, open society are still respected in the data economy when we go for the digital uh, Europe. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mia Petra. Um, perhaps I can immediately ask you a question uh, here, um, reacting to your presentation. So you take sovereignty from the perspective it has to be a European, an open European ecosystem. 
Do you think that uh, rather than national, than national, I understand it that way, do you think that business should actually subscribe to that? In other words, um, when we look at uh, competition from outside uh, Europe, China, United States, should they rather give preference to being part of a European ecosystem? Is there is, if there is a takeover bid from China, should they rather look around and see, isn't there someone with whom I can work together in Europe? Uh, as far as we can fully respect European values and laws, and, and that is my big interest, that if it's then a risk of uh, foreign uh, juridical system to enter into our data, Mm -hmm. Or uh, we should, like, like the, the cloud deck land, that if we want to elaborate that later, uh, how then uh, the foreign law enforcement case might enter into the European uh, data by the Europeans. Uh, so if we can guarantee that GDPR, which is like the now the name for the privacy uh, uh, in, in law, laws, uh, can be fully respected, I would not close European ecosystems from other players, but then we have to be very uh, strict on our uh, legislative terms to apply even one part or another part of the ecosystem is coming from uh, elsewhere. But I also think that uh, creating European ecosystems, if you want to call it sovereignty, means that we may not be uh, it's not good to be 99% uh, uh, dependent from, from other actors. And that is also for the infrastructure, the very concrete terms. What about the cable that cuts off? Do, is it always secured that it can be still uh, uh, functional in, yeah. in Europe? Yeah, that's a, that's a very clear answer. And actually it also relates to this dependency question was also this morning on the table now very uh, actual, uh, how much dependent are we on other countries outside Europe, for example, for critical medication or equipment like respiratory devices. Um, thank you very much, Mia Petra. We will uh, come back to you later, more questions. You already mentioned something about Cloud Act. That's of a lot of interest for everybody. We'll come back to that. Let's move to the second speaker. That's uh, Pierre Chastanet. Pierre Chastanet is uh, in the European Commission. He is the head of unit for cloud and software. And you can imagine he's very closely involved in the cloud policy, the data policy, uh, the free flow of non-personal data, but has also an extensive background. He's actually a former colleague of mine and I know he has been doing great work in the field of cybersecurity, ICT for societal challenges and other areas. Uh, Pierre has both uh, has a telecoms uh, background, but also international politics and economics background. So he's well-versed to give us uh, his view on these questions of what is it that we actually want? What is the policy? Is Are we going in the right direction with the policy? And what is it that we now should do to make it happen? Can we get uh, Pierre online? Yes, can you hear me properly? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, excellent. Uh, okay, many thanks, uh, Paul, for the, for the very kind uh, in introduction and congratulations to the CyberSec conference. Uh, I'm a regular attendee for uh, many years and I'm very pleased that you were able to maintain uh, this very prestigious conference under the, the current circumstances. Uh, so we're really seeing the, the digital technology at, at its best on what it uh, enables connecting people uh, wherever they are and uh, whatever the, the, uh, the difficult uh, circumstances. So uh, let, let me get started on uh, the uh, aspect of uh, that, that Paul has, uh, has just raised. Uh, data infrastructure and technologies are really at the heart of the digital transformation uh, that is going to uh, develop in the, in the coming decade. Uh, the, the past uh, decade was very much focused on consumer uh, data. Uh, the, the next decade is going to be about industrial uh, data, and that's really a revolution that Europe uh, cannot miss. Uh, so all sectors of the European economy are going to undertake that digital uh, transformation. And the successful digital transformation of uh, European economy essentially depends on the availability, but also the uptake by European companies uh, of uh, data processing uh, capacities and data processing uh, services. 
However, there is really a precondition uh, for, for this. Uh, enterprise will only do this if they can actually trust uh, the, those data uh, processing uh, capacities. Uh, and also uh, that they can rely on uh, the fact that um, this is secure, that this is uh, energy efficient, uh, uh, because they have to respond to the uh, societal challenge of uh, uh, environmental and climate change. Um, also to the economic aspect that they can access those uh, data services um, in an economic manner, meaning that the services should be not only high quality, but also affordable uh, to them. So therefore, you can understand the, the, the focus that we have put uh, in the data strategy on those uh, data infrastructure, so cloud infrastructure in, uh, in particular. Uh, but uh, as the previous speaker highlighted uh, also, other kind of data processing uh, infrastructures, so either much more centralized, like high performance computing, but also much more decentralized, and that's the emergence of uh, edge uh, computing, which is uh, also a very important uh, phenomenon, bringing the data closer uh, to the user, um, closer to where the data are actually generated. Uh, you may have uh, seen or read in the press that our commissioner several times has uh, put forward this vision uh, that currently 80% uh, of the data are stored and processed is in centralized uh, computing infrastructure. In five to 10 years from now, uh, it's gonna be 80% of uh, the, the data that are stored and processed at the edge. So really an inversion of the, of the trend from currently 20% uh, at the edge uh, to 80% in the, in the coming uh, five to 10 years. So, um, However, when we look today at the, at the cloud market in Europe and also in the rest of the world, there is really no difference uh, here. Uh, this is largely dominated by uh, a few large uh, global actors, uh, mostly originating from the US and China that have been extremely uh, successful uh, business-wide business uh, at push, pushing uh, their infrastructure, their technical solution uh, across the, the globe. And they have gained enormous uh, economies of scale by, uh, by doing this, which makes them uh, very competitive. When we look, uh, European-based cloud service provider only have a, a small portion of the of the of the market uh, share, uh, and those capacities in Europe are pretty scattered across uh, different uh, European uh, member states. So this is uh, our idea to try to bring uh, these uh, European capacities together. Uh, the idea is absolutely not to try to reconstruct an Amazon or uh, a Microsoft uh, competitor, but to have uh, some sort of an alternative uh, European offering on which uh, European uh, businesses, European public administration can rely for certain categories of data for a certain type of, uh, of processing. So, of course, that uh, offering will need to be uh, competitive. So we, we need to uh, really respect uh, the, the rules of the, of the market. Um, but if we think, for instance, at creating large uh, European data repositories in the health sector, in the automotive uh, sector for public administration, um, we must have a trustworthy, reliable, highly energy uh, efficient infrastructure and data services that will be able to host uh, those data services. And here you can start uh, already uh, seeing uh, the, uh, the strategic thinking that we have uh, behind, which is to articulate together uh, the uh, European uh, supply development together uh, with aggregated demand coming from a specific sector of the, of the European uh, economy for which there is a very strong uh, demand for storage and processing uh, following certain rules uh, at European uh, level. So this is a bit like a, like a motor. So we want to ignite uh, the, the motor and uh, supply and demand are going to, to fuel uh, each other. 
so that's one of the key uh, idea around uh, this high impact project that the commission has put forward uh, in its data strategy uh, on the 19th of, uh, of February and for which uh, the commission is expect uh, to uh, invest around 2 billion euros in the in the coming uh, years again not building uh, infrastructure or services from scratch but relying on existing capacities that are available and interconnecting uh, those capacities at, uh, at European level. The second point I, I wanted to mention is uh, the uh, uh, initiative that exists already in the in a member state. We're absolutely not starting from uh, uh, from scratch. Uh, Paul rightfully mentioned the Gaia X initiative, uh, which is uh, getting a lot of uh, attention by bus European businesses, uh, by a number of uh, of member states. But others are existing as well. Uh, they are maybe uh, a bit less visible in the in the media, uh, but we have identified uh, a number of initiative either targeted at uh, public administration, so uh, cloud for public administration. Uh, that's notably the case in, uh, in France, in Italy, in Poland, uh, where we see very successful uh, initiative uh, developing there. Uh, of course, our concern is that if every member state starts uh, developing the uh, more or less the same thing, where this is getting to, to fragmentation. So it's in our remit to foster necessary synergies at, uh, at European level. And the last point I, I wanted to, uh, to mention uh, is the importance of, uh, of security. We're seeing it uh, today with a recent attack, uh, cybersecurity attacks on, uh, on hospitals, uh, which are aggravating the situation uh, to a very stressed uh, health infrastructure uh, already. So uh, this is something that uh, the Commission identified many years ago uh, with the development of cyber um, uh, of hybrid threat. So combination of cyber and physical uh, attacks. So this is really uh, a big danger for the for the EU, uh, and this is uh, of absolute importance that we secure data services uh, infrastructure. For this purpose, the Commission has uh, mandated a NISA at the end of uh, last year, so in December 2019, uh, for the development of a cloud security certification scheme. And we hope that this scheme is going to be ready uh, before the end of the year. Thank but you. we'll stop here and uh, looking forward to further interaction. We will come back to you, Pierre, but just one quick question, because uh, I uh, want to encourage the audience to put also questions out. And I saw actually one quite interesting one is, very practical. Um, is the corona crisis going to have an impact on the deadlines for the consultation? Because I think the data strategy has a consultation deadline of the end of May, correct? Yes, that is, uh, that is correct. So, um... There may be um, uh, a little bit more time that is uh, that is given to this for people to uh, to make sure that everybody that wants to participate has a, has a chance to voice uh, their um, uh, their concern or their, uh, provide their, their input. Uh, but uh, I think our commissioner has been very clear that uh, what has been put forward by the commission on the 19th of February is an absolute priority for, for this commission. This is okay. a boat that Europe cannot miss, and we have to deliver according to the timings that are set out in those strategies. Yeah, yeah. So and data make... is even closely connected to the crisis too. Okay, Pierre, thank you very much. We will come back to you. Then uh, we move now to our third speaker. Very honored that we have another high profile, very high profile woman in digital affairs in Europe uh, here online, Celia bonefeld Dahl, Director General of Digital Europe. Uh, also member of uh, something that is one of the key elements in the AI strategy, the high level expert group on artificial intelligence and many other uh, initiatives at the, in the European scene like the European Commission's Digital Skills and Jobs Coalition. Extensive background in uh, business. I'm not going to repeat all of that, but I think both large business and also being the founder herself actually of a cloud provider, Globe IT. So someone who is uh, well known in Brussels, well known in Europe, well-known worldwide, honored to have you here. Celia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you everyone for actually uh, staying healthy and staying digital. So uh, I think uh, this conference actually shows the importance of digital in many ways. And one of the ways is that um, we are actually able to continue uh, a fair amount of our work in the world, uh, exactly due to, uh, to, uh, to the digital infrastructure 
not saying that this is not lacking investment in Europe. However, a big thank you and a big thank you for the invitation um, and allowing me to speak here. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to address just uh, shortly uh, the overall picture of, uh, of, uh, of AI. Uh, so the, the environment of which AI uh, is, is acting in in Europe. And uh, Mia Pedra said this is, a, this is something new. It's a new start of uh, technology. It's, uh, it's just having its impact. Uh, and and I, think, uh, I think this is very correctly said, even though that in the last uh, 10, 20 years, we actually, even 30 years, have used artificial intelligence. Now it's coming to an extent where we, we, it, it is, has a, a real effect on people's life. And uh, people are like everything else. We don't like change. We all say we like change until it hits ourselves, right? Then we are more or less reluctant and we, we do not like it. Um, but it's also uh, important to ask ourselves, are people really scared of artificial intelligence and what are they really scared of? And this question, I feel that we still have to answer. Uh, I myself have not met a lot of people who are scared of artificial intelligence or the consequences. What I've heard is some concern, are we losing our jobs? Do we actually have the right, correct skills? Do we actually understand? And to me, this is all, uh, it's really back to the fundamentals. We need to enable and empower people to work with AI and to create AI. And the worries that they have, many of them, the majority of them will be solved by actually having access to knowledge and having the capability of being a part of something instead of just being a viewer or user of something. Um, and therefore we should be careful as uh, policymakers, as businesses, not to push an unjustified uh, fear of something that people might not be afraid of. Uh, so let's look at you know, the dangers, the risk, and I, I think the commission is doing a great job here, to be honest. I think it has been a, it's been a turbulent process something, uh, sometimes in, in the AI group, but I must also say it is a very diverse group and it takes a lot of effort to get a lot of different people to agree on something. And I think what came out with the seven principles and the re recommendation was like everything in, in politics and the policy, it, it was too long. But it was also spot on in a, in a lot of things. And I think uh, if we look at uh, the response of going to the policy side first, um, we are very happy to see that uh, we are not losing speed and the momentum by inventing a new rocket, right? Uh, EU is uh, just about the, 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 the continent that is most well protected, consumers, citizens, are extremely well protected by regulation, by frameworks compared to many other places in the world. And do we believe that this is the right thing? Yes, we do. So um, what we need to do now is to find out are there gaps? Where are there gaps and where are, are the risks? And this is exactly the approach uh, that is being taken. So a risk-based appro approach um, and basically looking at potential gaps of existing frameworks. Because I would turn me uh, to, to, uh, to the challenge on AI that I am not sure that we totally have understood to it addressed in the correct, way yet, uh, uh, the correct way yet, which is the boosting of it. Not because it's not good what the commission is doing, because I think they're doing a lot of what they can, um, but we have created a Europe, which is right now, we see it in the coronavirus uh, strategies, we see it in data strategies, we see it in everything that is highly fragmented. And, uh, and still uh, regulations are either not being implemented or implemented in different ways, not harmonized. And this is really the biggest challenge for AI in Europe, where the scalability of markets, the scalability of innovations. And I don't think that we lack innovation. I think that we have a lot of, a lot of startups. So I, we have two components of something that we sometimes are discussing not to have. We have plenty of AI uh, uh, startups. We have plenty of AI innovation. We actually have some of the best AI specialists in the world. However, we don't know how to commercialize it. And if you are not, uh, you know, if you don't have the scale market and you uh, you are struggling with commercialization, yes, okay, then they don't become uh, world leading uh, in in AI. So. 
I would say um, one of the things that we are really highlighting is let's focus at the sectors where Europe is strong. So manufacturing sector, health, some of the areas where the European values are also really deeply um, incorporated, like health, like uh, public services to citizens, like transportation, and not least one thing that, um, that we are all not hearing from the Commission also, for example, sustainability. So it's important now, uh, I think we can say in the last 20 years, um, I think businesses realize when, and, and it is the case that the global collaboration amongst businesses is very well functioned, very well functioned. But the nation states have struggled to really uh, have a, a harmonized market and rule set to follow that development. So I think it's very important to keep an open economy, to keep an open mind, and to fix some of the fundamental problems uh, that are underlying on the AI agenda, which is fragmentation. Um, but I would say, uh, and then going to, to investment, a lot of good initiatives. Uh, I am a little bit, uh, if I should be critical, I would say we still struggle with the fact um, that the MFF is a design of the past. Um, the many of the investments pools are targeted towards subsidy, sub, subsidies for 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 uh, for industries that are struggling. Um, but we don't. We only have around two percent, a little bit more than two percent of the full budget, European budget, actually dedicated to digital. In spite of that being the only growth driver of our society. So if it's up to me, I would say I'm very full support of the risk-based approach very much uh, supportive of the sectorial approach, very much uh, supportive of the robustness. We might look at the cybersecurity uh, certification uh, initiatives here. Um, now it's important to focus. Where should we invest? What is the main uh, responsibility of the public sector amongst other citizens and public services? And where are the sectors that we need to boost, for example, uh, innovation and uh, and uh, and better business, which is amongst others, manufacturing, health, uh, and others. So um, we have taken a great step. We are discussing the right things, but as business leaders, we all know that if the money doesn't uh, if the if the money doesn't go where the mouth is, it's going to be very hard to actually uh, make uh, a strategy like that come true. So we are on the right path. Uh, but we need to look at, uh, take a hard look again at uh, at the investment strategy to make it follow uh, the, the 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 political ambitions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecilia, also for this rather um, optimistic uh, uh, outlook. Uh, in a minute, I will come back to you also in the discussion uh, to ask uh, to probe a bit deeper about uh, the data aspects uh, here because this session is largely about uh, data sovereignty and uh, security. Um, and, and perhaps the hook for that is uh, in the data strategy, there is a very important element, as Pierre has also said, and Mia Petra has uh, pointed to that, of um, federated cloud, of a cloud strategy. So I think the data strategy is actually a data strategy and a cloud strategy, you might say, uh, combined. Uh, Mia Petra, um, asking a little bit further, I mean, you are very much in favor of um, a European approach, an open European ecosystem approach. Uh, you're also saying, well, uh, we shouldn't lose the reality out of uh, sight that uh, in the cloud sphere, there are these big operators, American and Chinese, they are, that are dominating the market. Now on the table, we have here a federated um, cloud initiative proposed by the European Commission. What for you, well, first of all, do you believe it can become a success? And what would you advise to do to make that a success? Well, I, I liked very much the, the presentation from the Commission now by Pierre, uh, very much the same ideas that I, I've heard from the businesses and the users of the clouds, because, of course, a cloud as an infrastructure needs the users and, and what could be then done. I, I think we can ha ha learn from the, the big, the successful companies that uh, created data, but they actually created for the need. Google did it for their own need, uh, Amazon did it for their own need, Facebook did it for their own need, and then it was by byproduct that, hey, come on, this can be an own business for the clouds. 
So uh, what I understand that when the SMEs or even bigger players, when they want to buy cloud services, there is differentiation in between the clouds and that the Europe could be the one developing cloud for something. And I like very much the mentioning the health sector, the automotive or the transportation, all and all, uh, public services, but then also maybe defense. We want to do more on the defense. And so why, why not also to take the, the, the idea that there is a need and then we provide something that could be then both as the selling, then the, the uh, cloud services is the biggest question. And then when the buyer, the, the SMEs or others who need the data space, they have their own uh, criteria. So what is the price? What is the, the computing uh, powers? How the structure is? Uh, and so on and so on. So I think uh, we also need to spread information. I saw a study from Finland that the uh, a lot of SMEs, they were quite digital, but they were not using the cloud. And they, the, the reason was more or less guessing. And, and But I, I believed it was much on the uh, knowledge of the GDPR and other systems. And then the, the speaker of that panel said that actually GDPR is not doing your digital data. It is the, the personal data. So you have the sensors, you have the, a lot of the data that is nothing to do with the GDPR. So maybe some SME players are a bit afraid of the clear rules. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and one, one, one idea I would just like to add that is, is also that we can maybe do something when we start from the scratch, creating new ones is also that how the cloud uh, architecture is designed. Can we have the kind of model that there are like uh, cloud natives, the packaging of the data, how can it be developed? And if we can get some kind of new standards, so then at least it could be more easily transformed and not a lock in in one cloud service. I, I do not much believe that we only have to do this business on the same way that it's done before, but may, maybe then take the advantage that we are in the beginning of the era that everything will be in the cloud and so much new data will be. so always think the more clever way than the previous phase was yeah. Perhaps, uh, Pierre, you want to react to that because this is kind of uh, like saying, you know, it's not only federated cloud, but it's perhaps a federated health cloud or a federated defense cloud. So it's the, the use case, the data origin together with actually the cloud facilities. I mean, you were talking about the motor. Is this, is this feasible? Or uh, then I come back also to briefly to both uh, Celia and, uh, and, and Mia Petra. I mean, the areas that you mentioned, health and defense, are about the most fragmented areas that you have in Europe, isn't it? Pierre, does that work, this combination data and cloud? Yes, I de definitely. De um, we, we have, uh, if we want to make this a, a success, we have to focus on the data of the future, not the data of the, of the past. Uh, so we have to focus at where new data are going to be generated. Uh, so that's the case of the industrial sector, of the uh, automotive uh, sector. Uh, Mia Petra rightfully mentioned uh, other sector in, uh, in public administration, SME startup. Um, so we have to help those people that are not yet in the cloud to move uh, that demand, that aggregated demand at European level towards uh, European uh, offering. Uh, you're absolutely right that the health sector is going to be uh, really a challenge. The, the, the health system in itself is very fragmented at uh, national level, at European uh, level. It requires the involvement of regional uh, authorities. But at the same time, it's uh, a sector that has uh, a huge gap in its uh, digital transformation. So maybe we can combine uh, this and kill two birds with one stone. Uh, mm -hmm. So not only provide uh, the infrastructure that enables for hospital to uh, properly uh, operate, to store uh, patient records, do the billing, the uh, scheduling of, of patients uh, in safe and secured manner, but also um, to help interconnection of services to be able to host patients that will come yeah. from other countries so and provide new services. Yeah, uh, Cecilia, uh, if you hear this, I mean, you were the one that was breaking, bringing up uh, the, the fragmentation and that we are so good in fragmentation in Europe. So uh, do you believe this uh, federated cloud and the combination of data and cloud, can it become a European success story? Mm. 
I, I must say, uh, this is my personal view. I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical. Um, it has been tried in the last uh, 15, 20 years. Um, in every nation, like uh, like Pierre also said, it, it has been done. Uh, I mean, even in small Denmark, it has been tried in France, it's been tried in Germany. I, I'm skeptical. I'm not necessarily against as long as we are not uh, trying to invent the wheel and closing out, uh, you know, in existing players. Uh, that would be very, very bad, I, I believe, because it, many of them are a state of art. Mm. Um, I'm not sure. I am not sure it's the solution. If, if you ask me, I'm not necessarily against. We're still shaping our opinion as dig digital Europe, but but I'm but I'm rather skeptical. But I, what I do what I do believe is in the data spaces. I mean, there is a big, big, big need for uh, for Europe to become uh, to take lead in actually coordinating data spaces across Europe uh, in in key areas of their responsibility. I would say uh, for 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 public sector. Um, and to have to be able to advance, uh, you know, uh, public services in a range of areas um, mm -hmm. where we should be much more not depending on uh, where we live. I mean, let me take a simple area. So if you are living in a mountain village, uh, either in, let's say, Sweden or, or Italy, and uh, your, your math teacher in that village is very, very bad. Okay, then you have a whole uh, village who are very bad at math. Um, you will have the same uh, in in the in the health system if you live in a city where the hospital has a very low rating of the survival of cancer patients. Okay, you are stuck with that hospital and you can't do anything unless you are very rich and, and yeah. can travel. So these areas where there are big fragmentations in the quality of the services, uh, the fundamental services live, uh, delivered by a public sector in Europe. I believe is the primary uh, responsibility of the EU to coordinate and improve. Hmm. Um, yes, and I think that is where the focus should be. Is that Whether the infrastructure is totally the right one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but are you saying this, uh, Cecilia, because you think federated cloud is simply not the right model or you cannot win anymore against these giants who are, of course, also, let's be honest, members of digital Europe. So you say, well, you have divided views on that. Or do you say, like Mia Petra says, well, perhaps there's a new paradigm, but you need to uh, to be innovative. You need to experiment with it. Yeah. So um, not necessarily because I don't think it's the right model. Uh, I mean, I am more on the can this be done technically and innovation wise? Is it the right way to take a lot of different uh, quality of networks and mix them into one? And if you're lucky, I mean, <laughs> okay. So how do you how do you define quality? Uh, how do you get the right quality of, of the, all these suppliers? It's yeah. very, very, very difficult. Yeah. Uh, so for me, it's also as a technical person, I'm, I'm, I, I have my doubts whether this will actually uh, raise to the level of quality that, that we can do. And, and I don't see this. I have to say one thing. Okay. Yes, they are represented in digital Europe and rightfully so. I mean, honestly, many of them are state of art technologies, which we totally depend on and should. I mean, they should be a part of this. And I, as far as I have heard and learned, there is no plans to basically ex exclude them. And honestly, this would be, <laughs> this would be, uh, mm -hmm. if that is the intention, definitely, then it's not the right to do uh, thing to do. There is a reason why many of these have developed this as their core business. And I'm not saying that we don't have state of art in mind players, but there are also a lot of other players who are not state of art out there. And this is, so we have to be, be careful not to have the nomination of quality to going down just because we're trying to please everyone. Mm -hmm. Pierre, is, uh, are European companies, uh, is Europe strong in edge computing, this new paradigm? And I think people are also asking questions about edge computing. Let me have a look, but uh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. So th this is really um, uh, a very interesting uh, emerging uh, area. And we, we have to be careful with what is positioned as edge computing. A lot of the uh, traditional uh, cloud service provider are repositioning access point as edge computing. Well, that, that's not really the, the concept. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, however, we see quite a number of uh, startup European SMEs that are uh, really tr uh, providing true edge computing, which is basically a small uh, computing capacity uh, that is secured, energy efficient, and that is brought close to the uh, user needs. So uh, just to give a very concrete example, you take uh, a production line in a factory, well, all the process data of that factory, do they really need to be shipped back a thousand kilometers away from the mm. factory? Whereas most of the data uh, need to be accessed locally by the plant, the factory operators. Yeah. Well, probably storing and keeping the data at local level is perfectly That's okay. Yeah. Uh, let me let me uh, also perhaps in view of time, let me move to one more topic, which is uh, something that um, has to do with sovereignty, uh, which is the, the possibility of extraterritorial jurisdiction, the Cloud Act. Uh, uh, there's a lot of talk around it, um, but sometimes you're wondering, you know, is this kind of overrated or is it a real issue, a real problem? Um, Mia Petra, what's, what's your view on the Cloud Act? So the Cloud Act is the, the piece of legislation in, the Europe, in, the, in the United States that allows access uh, under certain conditions, obviously, uh, to uh, data in the cloud if they are held by, by US-based cloud uh, providers. And obviously, this has to do with uh, judicial investigations and those kind of things. Uh, what about that? Is the Cloud Act a problem? Mia Petra. Well, uh, now I must clarify that I'm not a member of the Libe committee. I work with the ITRE, so more with, with the innovations and industry and the people who want to provide services and make the economical rules going around uh, um, and then rolling. Uh, but then, uh, yes, I had very interesting talks about it when I wanted to get to know more. And, and you, are we overreacting or not? I could say yes and no. <laughs> yes, because uh, we are overreacting because if, if you read the whole title of this act, so act to clarify lawful overseas use of data act, and, and it is described the following way, the act to provide transporter access to communication data in criminal law enforcement investigations only. Mm. So when we talk about the criminal uh, law enforcement investigation, so only then we talk about the Cloud Act. So then of course it is uh, uh, then um, important and that's why we are not overreacting. It is utmost important that we can respect European laws when we talk about the Europeans our data stored in the American companies. And so then if the American uh, um, law enforcement cases can ask our, uh, also our uh, data, it is very principal questions. Mm. So first of all, I want to mention why the, this is a problematic. It is of course that we normally discuss and, and prepare uh, legislation together. This was not the case. It was not U US EU agreement, mm -hmm. as the MLATs are the the the, the current cases mutual legal assistant uh, uh, treaties. Um, it is problematic also because it never passed the Senate. Yeah. It was again one of those, or it was not discussed. It was again uh, those uh, spending bills that I have uh, many cases that I can refer yeah. in the, the current cases in US. So uh, this is the, the question and, and a good example of the trust that when the people need the users and all the citizens, we need trust in the systems. And then the trust means that it is publicly debated and that the public debate place is taken by the politicians in the Senate, in the yeah, Congress, yeah. in the European Parliament, and, and so. So I just want to emphasize that uh, e-evidence, which is not the easy case, which gives the European rules for this kind of uh, law enforcement data to be used, is still uh, pending in the negotiations. And then only after this e-evidence is ready, the Commission can make the contract with the US partners. So I think that I can speak in the favor of the, the Libe colleagues and European Parliament when I mentioned that this new uh, MLETs needs to be done. So then the current system that it takes so long time to have the, the, the data from the servers and the, 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 this important data for the law enforcement, uh, the co communication data, it takes months and it oh, cannot. So it has to be faster, but such such a updated MLATs also should contain the relevant and strong data protection safeguards. Very and to, I put it on the uh, easy way, if 
data that is in the investigation is not a crime in Europe, can we then even provide the information? So I hope that could be uh, agreed mutually because at the moment the companies are confronting with the yeah, they, picture of laws. Some are con uh, concerned about it. Cecilia, do you run into that? I guess it's a theme on the on your table too. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, first of all, uh, I think we have to remember what is the idea of it, right? The idea of it is to make sure that uh, that lawful access is actually uh, under certain rules, and uh, and that. Uh, that it, it's clarified what does it actually mean when uh, when when you have lawful access and i think that is very very good right and uh, if it has to be uh, opened revised discussed i mean well uh, i mean first of all uh, what we have uh, on the table is is actually something that that gives that clarity right now um so I think uh, just just uh, just criticizing it, it is definitely not a way. It's actually a way of cl clarification of what is what does lawful access actually mean. Yeah, yeah that's I think is also very helpful. Um, I think we are. Uh, I want to kind of uh, make sure that we finish more or less in time. But it's of course we cannot resist to come back to today's situation, the Corona crisis, and it's actually quite interesting. There is a bit of a parallel, well, perhaps a lot of a parallel between how we are dealing with this health virus Corona crisis and uh, some of the concerns around data security, cybersecurity and uh, sovereignty. So some of the examples uh, we have just seen almost like uh, one and a half weeks ago, almost the breaking up of the internal market of the single market, if it is about the shipment of um, essential goods that were necessary uh, for health in the context of the corona crisis but there's also a tendency you might say to break up uh, the single market when we are getting too concerned about or very concerned about sovereignty and about data flows and to some degree there is some data local localization also happening in europe so is there a risk that we are breaking up the internal market is something like a parallel from both and what do we learn from the corona crisis uh, there is another aspect in it. <clears throat> if you talk about cybersecurity, you really need to watch what is happening because uh, dangers can come from anywhere. So you risk running uh, into a surveillance society. And with the corona crisis, there has to be a lot more health surveillance. Yuval Harari wrote about a very good piece about that in the Financial Times just a few days ago, the risk of a surveillance society. So. That's another kind of thing that is in parallel between the corona crisis and the development of data, sovereignty and security. So for each of you, a quick comment. What do we learn from today's crisis that we should use in this field? Perhaps I can start with uh, Cecilia. Yes, so thank you so much. I mean, for me, it, uh, it tells us three things. One, it tells us that there are a few things, fundamental things that doesn't really care about nation state borders. It's sustainability, it's digital, it's cyber, it's corona. It's all these big things that really uh, runs into our lives. They don't care if we are Italian, Danish, or even Chinese. And it shows that uh, we need to be much more open-minded and much less protectionist uh, power structures to actually um, address these uh, big challenges and uh, and policymakers all over the world needs to recognize that it also tells us that EU is needed more than ever to actually harmonize crisis response. Yeah. Uh, it, I think you know as a Dane I was called home uh, to to Denmark to sit in my home office here. Uh, I was not called uh, by the EU to stay where I was or whatever right so yeah, I think it, it also shows us that that EU has a long way to go still in many of the responses, but that it's needed more than ever. Uh, and then word. lastly, uh, that we need to be extremely flexible and less scared of actually using data for the benefit of citizens. Mm. I mean, uh, we know right now that 80% of uh, the European citizens, they are willing to share their health data. If of course we take privacy concerns, so let's get it done. I mean, next time we have to respond to this, we should be faster and we should be doing it in one harmonized way, not closing borders in 10 different ways, not using data in 10 different ways and all struggling to find out how to do a response. 
So much more focus on how to do the big things in the big institutions instead of the small institutions. Thank you. Uh, Pierre, there was just a few words about this. What is your take on it? Yes, indeed. The, 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 uh, I would very much agree with the, the, the last point of, uh, of Cecilia on the, on the importance of uh, European cooperation, European solidarity, and avoid uh, the, the fragmented approach that, uh, that we have occasionally seen in the, in, in the crisis. The, 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 um, uh, putting uh, a bit closer to the, to the data, uh, this is a very good uh, analogy that we can make between uh, having a very centralized approach to uh, data management in the EU, or actually leverage this uh, fragmentation that we have. And instead of um, trying to uh, have central pot of data uh, that will try to gather all data for one sector, rather have a distributed approach. So uh, do call the data when you, when you need them, wherever they are uh, stored and processed in the, in the EU, uh, and then make new data out of it. So collaboration and yeah, A very good analogy to make uh, for, the, for the future. Thank you. Um, Mia Petra. Yes. Yeah, the, the two, two questions. The internal market part is, is a big sin for us that if we don't understand, and I, I think more and more people understand the global production chains that they are happening in uh, many, many sectors in life, uh, in good and bad. I think we have to learn about it. Uh, in Finnish, there is a saying that do not put all the eggs in the same basket. I don't know if there's the English, yeah. but then uh, uh, understanding this, this is also that how to build your uh, production chains, that if you're all dependent one corner of the world, it's, then it's too much uh, specialized. But the answer is not go back to inside the national border yeah. borders, then it's too bright. But I also uh, want to put here the the kind of uh, picture that Harari is pro, uh, wrote in his uh, World After Corona, very good article. I recommend for everyone on a free FT article uh, that also it is that what kind of nation uh, do we want to be? What kind of society? And I, as a Nordic, I believe very much in the open national, uh, the, the open society that people are informed and ra behave rationally. And, and not to only like uh, the banning and, and the, the big rules that everything that you have to uh, uh, specifically ban or allow. But then also it, it brings here the, the idea of the, the innovations that we do have that gives you yourself own data. The rings, the Finnish Aura rings is, is an innovation that people actually could see that I'm having a, a little bit fever. Should I control more? Do, how do I feel? So this is also the part of the big game on the health, on the yep. data society, that you have my data that is uh, valuable, then it's uh, your right to know uh, more, hopefully, than the others know or the big brother knows. Uh, and, and that's the two with the surveillance also that I, I very much emphasize the Harari's world for the open society that people are active players and not the target of the totalitarian or authoritarian society and yeah. made my data is a good concept to to keep on mind all the time thank you mia petra i think these are very encouraging words from all three of you and perhaps to add to that that the single market actually got not broken up because actually the european commission is acting at this moment in time so i think there is a degree of european collaboration at the moment critical moment in time and european uh, leadership i want to sincerely thank uh, our three panelists uh, for dealing with a difficult topic on which we have many, many um, thoughts and uh, certainly also differences of opinion, but which overall I think I can, we can conclude there is quite a promising way forward uh, for Europe and actually for people generally in the world in the, the type of approaches that we are developing here in, in Europe. So thank you once again, and I hand back to Barbara to take us to the next stage of the conference. Goodbye.